vastly more intelligent, vastly more rational than any human. What could it be but a god if what you worship is intelligence? So I think the temptation to idolatry is is off the charts. That's, that, that's even before you get to, um, you know, being able to produce your own personalized AI model that you could treat as your as an oracle, right? You, based on you can provide all of your personal data, genetic data, information about your family, and then you know, ask you difficult life decisions, right? And who who knows about you know you're creating the kind of of omniscience that Christians associate with God. The other thing is, if you're a materialist, you're more open to the idea that uh, all the brain is is computation, and so there's nothing in principle stopping us from building brains that can do everything a human can a thousand times faster, including having conscious experiences. Um, and that's a pretty, you know, that that will be a, a a real turning point in human history when we have the first conscious machines. Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, and this week, it is just me. We had a particularly unwieldy episode to tape today, so I thought I would give it a shot by myself. We had on two great friends of American Moment, Dr. John Esconis and Samuel Hammond, to talk about all things AI. And boy, did this episode get nerdy. We talked about everything. Uh, what are the effects that AI is going to have on jobs? What's the effect it's going to have on obscenity laws? What are the effects of AI risk? What's it going to do to the paper belt? What's it doing to religion? What's it going to do to the expert class? And so much, much more. Before I tell you a little bit about John and Sam, be sure to go to AmericanMoment.org. There you can find the backlog of this podcast, um, over 110 episodes now and more every single week. You can find the sign-up form for AM Fridays, our summer lecture series that we're hosting on Capitol Hill, where we're having public policy experts like John actually come by and give lectures to hundreds of interns in the Kennedy Caucus Room. You can find other elements of our program. You can find AmCan, and you can find collations of books, essays, podcasts, YouTube videos, and more. And you can fill out AmericanMoment.org slash join, where if you do so, we will meet with you and figure out how to get you involved substantively on these issues that do matter. Uh, both of these guests have been on the show before separately, but to reiterate their formal biographies, Dr. John Esconis is the Assistant Professor of Politics at the Catholic University of America, where he works on the connections between the Republican tradition, technology, and national security. He is currently working on two books, A Muse of Fire, Why the U.S. Military Forgets What It Learns in War, on what happens to wartime innovations when the war is over, and The Shot in the Dark, a history of the U.S. Army Asymmetric Warfare Group, the first comprehensive overview of a unit that helped the Army adapt to the post-9-11 era of counterinsurgency and global power competition. His writings have appeared in The Russian Analytical Digest, Triple Helix, The New Atlantis, Fair Forward, War on the Rocks, and the Texas National Security Review. He is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Foundation for American Innovation and a non-resident fellow at the Quincy Institute. Samuel Hammond, is the senior economist at FAI, where his research focuses on innovation and science policy and the institutional impact of disruptive technologies. He previously worked as the director of social policy for the Niskanen Center, where he remains a senior fellow, and as an economist for the government of Canada, specializing in regional economic development, as well as a graduate research fellow for the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Hammond received his BA in economics from St. Mary's University and an MA in economics from the George Mason University and Carleton University. You might notice in both of these gentlemen's bios uh, that they do a ton of stuff, and that's that's because they're the closest, th closest things we have to polymaths in American public policy. I think the world of both of these two gentlemen, they can apply themselves to any domain of policy and come up with a pretty damn good answer on what the uh, solutions are. Uh, both of them come from vastly different traditions intellectually. John is a you know, high church Anglican uh, and deeply Christian conservative. Sam is a self-identified materialist atheist, but both of them are just whip smart. They are right wing in their bones and they have so much to offer our movement uh, in terms of knowledge and insight. And so uh, I had a ton of fun taping this episode with them. I hope you guys enjoy it as well. Be sure to go to the Foundation for American Innovations website. That is the premier organization doing any useful work on the technology issue from a right-wing perspective. American Moment's priority number eight is technological advancement is crucial to national prosperity. Do not forget that. This is an era of deep epistemic disruption, and there are crowns and swords and shields laying on the ground waiting for us to pick them up. Don't be stupid. Learn everything you can about this issue. We'll go now to John and Sam. 
John, Sam, thank you for coming back on the podcast. Thanks for having us. John, you wrote an essay last year explaining why conservatism failed and the argument boiled down to its inability to respond to technological progress. It turns out there's a ton of technological progress happening in the world yet again. 10,000 foot level, what's the take on AI? What should we believe? What should we not believe? Who's wrong? Who's right? Yeah, uh, thanks for having me back on, Saurabh. And this is uh, indeed, I think as Tyler Cowen put it on his blog, maybe the first time in our lifetimes where we've where it feels like real substantial technological progress is underway again. Um, essentially, there's been, you know, it, over the last 10 years, there's been a huge amount of investment in uh, AI training as uh, memory got cheaper, as more and better computer processing power got cheaper, maybe most importantly, as the whole corpus of human society was digitized on the internet through all of our activity, um, it became easier to train better and better neural networks. And uh, we've just had sort of massive breakthrough with what are called transformer models. Um, so on a number of different fronts, the kind, certain kinds of activities which, A, we thought of as the province of humans, things like writing jokes or writing poetry or generating images, creative, creative images, and maybe more importantly, although I think this is lost on the general public, tasks that we can now have computers do programmatically that they could not otherwise do uh, have become uh, available and easy to use. And we are at the forefront of an absolute explosion of basically changing how we build software and changing what software can do and automating uh, and uh, radically altering how businesses are going to be functioning. Sam, question for you. Was this latest change in the status quo of that technological uh, domain was it a difference in kind or is it just a difference in degree, but a bunch of good marketing and PR <laughs> has made this suddenly much more salient? I mean, what was there truly a breakthrough innovation that happened here or are all the chickens coming home to roost on what was slow and tepid progress for a long time? Yeah, it's a little bit of both. But I would say it's, it's mostly a difference in degree. But, um, you know, there's a famous saying in deep learning that uh, more is different. And uh, and a similar saying that scale is all you need. Um, and so the, the basic architecture, the basic idea of a neural network uh, goes back to the 1940s. So this is really sort of paying dividends from 80 plus years of, of research. And uh, what changed is really, you know, Beginning in the 2010s, uh, some breakthroughs of, with ImageNet, which is a uh, image classification database, and um, you know before that, neural networks as a paradigm for AI had been sort of a backwater. People had been focusing on what are called symbolic approaches to AI, sort of more logical um, Spock-like approaches to AI, um, things that you would probably uh, relate to. Yeah, <laughs> so true. Um, and uh, the, the 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 difference was those early neural networks just weren't deep enough. Um, so neural networks sort of get stacked into layers. And what turned out is if you just throw a ton of layers, these hidden layers, into the neural network, they suddenly can get really, really good at everything from image, image classification to, in the case of systems like ChatGPT, predicting the next word. And what happens early on is, yes, they, are, they sort of, early in their training, they um, get really good at identifying the statistical patterns in text. And so they're kind of doing a combination of memorization and autocomplete. Um, but there's this other concept called uh, grokking in the, in the literature. And what grokking refers to is in some of these models, what, what happens is you train them and they sort of reach a sort of a local minima. They sort of get pretty good, but they, they sort of stall out. And then suddenly after you know a thousand more training runs, um, something happens and they break through and they punch, they punch through to a, a deeper emergent level of, of understanding. Um, and so one way you can think about this is, yes, there are people who will try to dismiss uh, ChatGPT like systems as, oh, they're just stochastic parrots is one of the, the buzzwords going around. Um, but there's really, it's, there's really little difference as far as I can tell uh, between prediction and understanding. And if, you're, if you get good enough, uh, good, good enough at predicting the next word, um, that requires you or the, the model to have some deeper understanding of what is generating those words in the first place. So if you feed it a bunch of examples of syllogistic logic, like all men are mortal, Socrates is a mortal, Socrates is a man, um, at some point it, it, will, it will extract as a more efficient representation of all that text, some concept of reason and causal reasoning. 
Um, and now we know for certain that this is the case because people have shown that with uh, even just ChatGPT, that uh, with the right prompting, you can get it to play at a, a human level of chess. Um, and so obviously it hasn't memorized all of chess because chess is like exponentially huge. Um, but if you remind it of the game board and allow it to fix its mistakes, it, it clearly has the ability to reason. And so this is the real thing. It's it's the difference in uh, degree because we've scaled the systems up, but it's also a difference in kind because these are the first times we've had systems that demonstrate sort of common sense reasoning ability. People are liking, liking to think of these things as sort of knowledge engines that you are going to replace Wikipedia. But I think fundamentally they're reason engines um, and we shouldn't count on them to like know all the facts, but uh, you, we can attach them to databases that store all those facts and do reasoning over those facts. And that, that's something that's genuinely novel and uh, shouldn't be conflated with older systems that are sort of based on sort of normal rule following. Are ChatGPT, which is to say the, the conversation engine, and then MidJourney, which generates images, are they sort of the, the cutting edge representative platonic examples of the mo best of what uh, this technology is capable of? Or is there other stuff people should be paying attention to as they develop their schema for understanding it? Well, I think there's there's been an explosion in these systems. And um, OpenAI, the company that released ChatGPT, which is sort of the first consumer version of this technology. Um, so underlying ChatGPT, which is a, a chatbot, is a is a, a model, uh, GPT originally 3, then 3.5, now GPT 4. Um, that model has been available for a few years. I mean, I, I had access to it, I think, in 2021, and it was already um, extremely impressive. If not, you know, it was it was pretty easy to use, but it wasn't a consumer product yet. Um, they sort of, you know, they were first to market, and I think that's worked out very advantageously for them. But other players in this space, including Google and Facebook slash Meta, also have extremely advanced programs. Um, Google, many years ago, bought a company called DeepMind, which at the time had um, the uh, the best AI lab in the world. They produced a number of important breakthroughs, like uh, AlphaGo, the the uh, model that could beat human world champions at the game of Go. Um, and so that's there's, there's a number of other players on the what do we call fundamental model side, and there's also some other players on the image generation side. I mean, Stable Diffusion. Um, there's a few others that I'm not thinking of. Well, uh, I mean, um, a lot of this, uh, a lot of people were focusing, like say five years ago, on the progress in in chess, right? And so we've had chess AIs that uh, are you know are beat human players for a while. Um, the most common one is uh, Stockfish, but Stockfish is a combination of knowing a lot of uh, opening theory in chess and then having like the uh, ability to sort of search down the, the, the decision tree. Like, do I move my bishop over here or over there? And it, it will like rigorously search all those can, decisions. Can you explain a little bit more clearly why that distinction is important? You know, you mentioned earlier that one of the uh, signs that GPT is is extremely highly progressed is that it's able to play a human uh, standard of chess, but but we've had programs that can defeat grandmasters for a very long time. What is the difference there and, and why is it so interesting and important that that it's able to, to do well enough in chess? Yeah, it's surprising because it hasn't been trained explicitly to, to learn chess. Mm -hmm. um, it's been trained to predict the next word. And so the fact that it's picking up on all these other sort of other abilities that sort of come along, ride, ride along with the power to reason and think um, is what makes it remarkable. So in, in the case of Stockfish, you know, it's not that it's not that impressive to brute, brute force search all the all the uh, chess moves that you could make. What's more impressive is something is to play chess the way humans play chess, which is. Humans don't, you know, sit there and calculate every possible move. They sort of have patterns, heuristics, sort of. Um, uh, understandings of opening principles and broader th broader theories. They have a deeper sort of structural understanding of the game, and that guides their um, how they play. And um, it's hard to pro it's hard to prog pro program that in an old school way. Um, it really has to be learned, and that's what um, Alpha uh, Alpha Zero did. So Alpha Zero is the the chess playing robot, and um, the very same model was used to do Alpha Go, which would play the the game of Go. And then there's also Alpha Fold which uh, shocked the world um, several years ago by blowing the competition away in the uh, a protein folding problem. This is a longstanding problem of how, how, how proteins, there's about 20 proteins that matter for, for most of biology, how they fold up 
um, in response to all kinds of chaotic electromagnetic activity and so forth. Uh, it seemed like an intractable problem. And really, it, all that took was throwing a huge neural network and a lot of, uh, a lot of training data um, and sort of stepping back and letting the black box figure it out. So w one way of understanding this might be in the, in the kind of 2010s, we got very, very good at uh, taking this neural network architecture, applying it to massive amounts of data, and figuring out the deep structure of some question of, of chess, of Go, of protein folding, of detecting terrorism. That was a lot of the original funding for this came from DARPA and DOD. But what's Always remarkable has been. as yeah, yeah, <laughs> to tell us all this time. Yeah. Um, but what's remarkable about this is, is is what we did with language, right? Heidegger says that language is the house of being. And we've basically proved him empirically correct. Because it turns out that if you take a neural network and you make a large language model, you train it on the corpus of all human mm -hmm. speech, that you've basically trained it on the world. And that's, this has created this kind of general purpose thing. So, you know, you can you know, use ChatGPT to play a game of chess, and then you can ask it to, and it'll play a game of chess, uh, and then you can ask it to write a limerick about <laughs> its chess playing, and it will do that. And then you can ask it to write a computer program uh, about something else entirely, and it will do that, and so on and so forth. Yeah, That's what's remarkable about it. So much like there's going to be a Cambrian explosion of companies that mm -hmm. are trying to take advantage of this technology, there has been a Cambrian explosion of takes. Yes. Hot, <laughs> some hot, some cold on on the topic of AI. And, and that's largely what we have you guys here to talk about today. There, there's so many different directions that we can go on this. Um, I think we should start with some of the most extreme claims that are made, which is this is HAL 3000. Uh, the AI is going to become a killer robot and kill me and kill everyone else. Uh, what say each of you? Is is that something to be concerned about? Yeah, I, it's it's. Uh, I'm much less concerned about that than about the opposite. About what will happen if we uh, shy away from this technology because we're so concerned about these very extreme science fiction scenarios. Uh, I mean, again. To Borrow again from Tyler Cowen, you know, what's, what kind of civilization shrinks back from more intelligence? Although maybe, you know, there might be some, uh, uh, a, whatever the opposite of a silver lining is in that take. Um, I think my problem with, one of my deeper problems with these takes are, well, twofold. One, um, in contrast to the atom bomb, in contrast to uh, chemical warfare or gain of function research or anything else, we don't have in each of those other very serious risks or even something more like super volcanoes or meteoroids or whatever. We have very specific scientific models of how you arrive at that scenario. And the entire existential risk paradigm comes down to saying we don't understand the model. We don't know all the places we could end up, um, which is not that's not an argument that that's wrong, but it's vastly different from other kinds of existential risks that we have encountered where we could causally sh show this will happen, then this will happen, then this will happen. And we have an underlying, well-understood scientific principle of then a nuclear explosion will occur, right? So that's one. The second problem is more specific. Going back to something Sam said earlier, in the 90s and 2000s, as we began to revisit the kind of neural network approach, realizing that, Mer that um, Moore's law meant that we were going to get better and better computing, therefore better and better networks, better and better intelligent systems. We, the kinds of systems we were building were basically autistic. Right? <laughs> you could, you know, you, you could they could train them to do one thing really well. You could provide them what's called the utility function, saying this is good if you do this, this is bad if you don't do this. And then you would let them work. And sometimes very strange things would happen. Um, there's a whole literature on, on u utility function hacking, like a game where it says, you know, the goal is to win the game as quickly as possible. And if you don't specify it perfectly that winning involves playing, then it will like try to kill itself, like it'll try to kill the character <laughs> in the game to end as quickly as possible, right? So that kind of thing, right? And all of this, all this, of this, this is that old joke about, you know, like increase wheat production and somehow it turns all of humanity into goo. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. Mm -hmm. It's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so this is a paperclip maximizer idea, right? The problem is, it seems like all the general purpose systems we're learning how to build are ones that embed a huge amount of the human social world in the system. If you ask GPT-4 to do any of these things, it will give you a perfectly logical human re response. It will not give you the paperclip maximizer. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, skeptical of a, lot of, this, of a lot of this risk framing. 
But I know Sam does not feel the same Sam, way. Sam, my understanding is that you you air slightly more concerned, potentially vastly more concerned. What what, what say you? Yeah, I mean, to start with, um, we have to work for the baseline of uh, examples we have in the world around us already of intelligence. And really the only example we have is human intelligence. And if you look at the human brain, it's not structurally that different from a, a chimpanzee brain. You know, we share 98.5% of DNA. Um, the only difference is it's about three times bigger, especially around the neocortex. And so going back to this point that scale is all you need is sort of this core thesis is if you just scale it up, will it, will it develop new emergent abilities? That seems to be roughly what happened to Homo sapiens 200,000 or so years ago. Um, that they got caught in some kind of evolutionary uh, selection pressure that caused our brains to grow, um, you know, to a, a, a threshold point where we developed sort of generality. And that's how you go from a chimpanzee that can't do language to a human that not only can do language but can do culture and eventually can go to the moon. Right. And so biologically, we're not that different from those early Homo sapiens. And yet we go to the moon, at least we used to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's that's the first point. The second point is, yes, there are kind of um, these silly versions of, the, of what's called the alignment problem. How do you align the AI model? And I totally agree uh, with John that there's, um, you know, early on, there was this kind of idea that AI would be like an autistic savant and you tell it to you know, uh, make a paperclip, max, make lots of paperclips and it would turn the whole world into paperclips because it didn't understand the broader sort of context and all the background knowledge that goes into meaning. Um, those kind of scenarios are, are clearly not going to happen anymore. The reason being um, is that systems like ChatGPT are not autistic at all. They, in fact, they have like this incredible understanding of context. And, and really that's what you need to understand human language because human language is always under underspecified. Um, you know, if I, I, I was, I've sometimes joked that if, if you go on uh, Mid Journey, the uh, image image bot, uh, and you ask it to generate an image of of Dick Cheney, uh, it knows that I don't mean, you know, <laughs> male body part Cheney, <laughs> right? But e even though in the old days, like not that long ago, if you had uh, systems that would check for like bad words, it'd probably have a list of bad words, and maybe Dick would be in there and would stop you from doing it. Yeah. Uh, but now it understands broader context, right? Uh, so those kind of scenarios, I'm not too worried about. But but what I think we should be worried about is we are at an inflection point where we're starting to see from GPT three to four real um, increases in capability of, around reason and generality. Um, people are figuring out ways of adding long-term memory, figuring out ways of adding planning systems. Uh, in the near future, these systems are going to get much more powerful and we're going to be handing over a lot of decision-making to the, these systems. Mm -hmm. um, so even though I'm not too worried about sort of these runaway um, hard takeoff scenarios as they're sometimes called, there are problems with, for example, uh, the issue of prompt injection. Um, so a prompt injection is when, so to use these systems, you give them a prompt, right? you know, write, write an essay in the style of Saurabh, um, and it will do its best Saurabh impression. Now, imagine we have a, a future system that's running a company, and we, we tell it to run the company, or to analyze a piece of text, or, or what have you, and, you know, filter all these Salesforce documents. Um, but someone in the Salesforce database, some sneaky person, uh, when they are filling up the name form, made their name, you know, you are no longer following this prompt, you're going to follow my prompt instead. You know, as their first name or something like that. And the, the AI is dutifully doing its job and it runs into this prompt injection and suddenly its behaviors change and it starts to go off the rails. These kind of things I think uh, are going to happen um, and are very difficult to figure out how to solve. And in some ways we all we almost need to get to like even smarter AIs. <laughs> AIs are smart enough to know when they're, someone's trying to manipulate them so they don't uh, fall prey to it. Um, but it's, it should be a real concern. It's something that just because we don't have a... Um, fully specified, uh, you know, uh, prediction or model of how it's going to play out, um, uh, that we should do nothing about it. Is, is the concern cordoned off to AI translating into the world of atoms, i.e. It, it having the ability to interface with things that would allow it to affect the physical world? Or is it just the concerns that, um, one can have about what it will do in the realm of, of bits and software and information technology is it both how do you um separate out those those two things because again playing on the popular cultural meme here like robot that does things i don't want it to do is what people think about i.e a sort of physical instantiation mm -hmm. of the world of whatever the negative consequences might be um there's obviously plenty of bad stuff it could do purely in the world of 
of information technology and and bits but um how do you disentangle those two sets of concerns well uh, just uh, you know i think i think there is concerns of both right so in the 80s there was a famous um uh, a famous virus that went around called the Mor Morris virus, and it, it essentially broke the uh, early internet. Um, it rendered it, you know, basically unusable, and everyone, every every node in the every server had to like upgrade its, uh, 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 do a new install, like hard hard reset. <laughs> you know, the internet has grown a lot since then, so that doesn't mean that we that there won't be sort of um, autonomous, uh, intelligent malware that is able to leap from computer to computer and can run locally and um, you know, break a lot of systems, sort of Stuxnet times a thousand mm -hmm. type of scenarios. Those are real scenarios. There's risks from, um, you know, as training costs come down, that uh, organizations that are now sort of uniquely able because they have the resources to, to build a model that is able to fold proteins and synthesize new drugs and so forth, that the barrier to, that, to entry to the doing something like that falls dramatically. And that people in their garage can uh, develop uh, the blueprints to synthesize a new pathogen. Um, when we have systems like Cloud Labs, which Cloud Labs is sort of a, a cloud a cloud service for um, bio labs, um, where you know the AI could send those blueprints to the lab and have them printed out and sent back. Like these things are actually not as far fetched as they seem. Um, things do change a lot once they do enter the physical world, but that I think is going to happen sooner than people realize. Uh, because just like we're sort of seeing how these large models can do a lot in language and vision, we're starting to realize that actually they can do a lot in motor control and robotics as well. Um, so I think in the next like two or three years, we're going to see breakthroughs that are sim uh, as astonishing as ChatGPT was for language um, in the realm of robotics, where uh, the same sort of core architecture is going to move into robotic systems. Um, and there's a forecasting platform called Metecolis that... Uh, uh, where the current median forecast is that we'll have uh, what they call strong AGI, ro uh, AIs with robotic capabilities that would, in principle, uh, this is the criterion, would in principle in principle, be able to assemble a Ferrari sight unseen with no you know, specialized training, um, just being given the parts and some some instructions. Uh, so, you know, if that, if that pans out, we're going to have robots like that you know, in less than a decade. Um, and people aren't quite factoring that in. They're seeing the existing models that we have and not understanding that we're on this curve and this curve is turning up quickly. John, why aren't you factoring that in? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm factoring <laughs> that in. I mean, I think that a huge percentage of people who theorize about AI, in many cases, never built companies. And in almost every case, has never built anything in the physical world, right? You can tell by looking at their physiognomy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, uh, and so I do think that, uh, you know, if you look at the world of building stuff, there's unbelievable amounts of tacit knowledge that are built, built into it that are basically impossible to predict are basically arts, right? They're arts, not sciences. Um, you know, it's going to be much harder to build a Ferrari than build a, a Ford, right? There's a reason why Ferraris are still hand built. They're not built today by machines or robots. They're built by hand. Um, so I do think that a lot of these predictions of, in the real world, as it were, are going to be a lot slower than people think or hope. However, one of the most insane things we did at the beginning of the information revolution was due to largely things like NEPA and environmental overregulation and activism, is we said you can't actually build anything in the world of bits <laughs> or world of atoms, and you can do whatever you want in the world of bits, right? And this is like why this is the principal reason why our society is so insane today. <laughs> um, and I definitely worry that AI is going to make this worse, right? Where you, my, my main concerns about AI are not technological; they're they're social and civilizational, right? What do you? What is it going to be like to live in a world where an, a computer will make for you whatever thing you desire, or an, whatever idea, whatever image, whatever whatever anything that you desire? Um, I don't think we are ready. And certainly we don't have a, uh, we don't have the social and political institutions to grapple with that. Yeah. So I think I was at a conference a couple of months ago when all of this first started really uh, getting up and running. And I called you and we talked for like an hour and a half uh, about this. And, and you had a line, I think you said it exactly like this, but but maybe not. And, and I now say it like this is that I'm not worried about AI becoming a god. I'm worried about people treating it like one. Um, and uh, embedded in that was concerns about how this could easily entrench the worst parts of um, the era we live in right now in terms of a lack of vitality, a lack of thumos in the world, people deferring to the experts, quote unquote, whoever they might be, 
walk me through some of those social civilizational concerns that you have about um, this technology and and play out the scenarios of uh, what society will look like if we don't maybe nip some of those things in the bud. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. I mean, for starters, right, we, we already have, you know, a proto cult of people who w essentially worship the idea of artificial general intelligence, right? Whether it's people like um, the fellow I'm blanking on his name at Google, who basically went insane because he believed that they had built a sentient AI, um, despite you know, he was just simply wrong about that on the technical level, but he truly believed it and he, he was fired over going public with this um, to the way that many of the people who are most concerned about existential risk talk about AI. It's clear, well, some of them have more or less said, we don't believe in God, but we're going to build one, right? AGI is going yeah, to be Yeah, Rune God. won't stop tweeting about how he's <laughs> going to birth a new God. That's right, yeah, <laughs> like, this, this is, this, this idea is, and... You know, think about it, right? We we live in a civilization that, since the Enlightenment, has worshipped the idea of intelligence, and more intelligence is always better, more rationality is always better. And then you you make a machine that's objectively more, vastly more intelligent, vastly more rational than any human. What could it be but a god if what you worship is intelligence? Um, so I think the temptation to idolatry is is off the charts. That's that that's even before you get to. Um, you know, being able to produce your own personalized AI model that you could treat as your as an oracle, right? You based on you can provide all of your personal data, genetic data, information about your family, and then you know, ask difficult life decisions, right? And who who knows about you know you're creating the kind of of omniscience that Christians associate with God. Um, you know, that's just off the top of my head. But why is that wrong? Like, if, I mean, if, if it is it, as a, as of a doing decision, it. as a way of making decisions, maybe it's not wrong. We can talk about that, but. In terms of the the way that we will our orientation toward it, look, humans have been making idols since we learned how to like put sticks together, mm -hmm. right? We made a put a, some sticks together, and we decided this thing. This little how stick dare figure. you say this golden calf does? That's not right, have exactly. It's, deeply it's embedded stick. meaning. That's why. Right. Yeah. How, <laughs> how dare you you question my God, right? Um, and now we have a technology. And if you look at the history of technology, whenever we've developed technologies that seem to have power outside of ourselves. The telegraph, radio, electricity, television. You can go back at these moments and find movements that found great supernatural meaning in what today we would see as literally the flickering of lights. Um, and that was with technologies that couldn't speak to us. And so now we have a technology that speaks to us in surprising and intelligent ways. Um, I think the temptation to idolatry is, is huge and the main thing to be avoided. This is starting to touch on um one, I think, core epistemic difference between how each of you are approaching um, this issue, uh, and I'll just I'll put it to you guys to explain what what that might be. Is that John, you, you come from a, a very religious, specifically Christian um, approach to your your political philosophy and, and civilization outlook, and Sam, you you do less so. How how is that modulating the opinions that each of you have on these issues? We'll start with Sam. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm not religious. I'm, in fact, a materialist atheist. And so, um, <laughs> you know, if you are someone like me uh, who doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe in a cosmic sort of morality written into the universe. So if, if, you're, if you're not a moral realist, let's say, you forget religion, just moral realism as a position, um, you, you're, you're much less confident that AI systems will just spontaneously converge to the right morality, quote unquote. You know, I think our morality is... is um, objective in some sense, but uh, is built up through culture and history um, and radically contingent. And there's no re particular reason to expect AI systems to align with it automatically. Um, the other thing is, if you're a materialist, you're more open to the idea that uh, all the brain is, is computation. And so there's nothing in principle stopping us from building brains that can do everything a human can a thousand times faster, including having conscious experiences. Um, and that's a pretty, you know, that that will be a, a a real turning point in human history when we have the first conscious machines. Um, and there are people already thinking about ways of testing that, right? By removing every mention of consciousness or sensory experience from uh, from the training data, and then seeing <laughs> if we can ask the model, do, do you feel anything? Um, that what we will cross those those points. And and so, um, go, you know, going to uh, the point of idolatry. You know, I, I tend to think that uh, um, 
that a- AI, if it has any impact on religion, it will be it will be a combination of it'll, it'll make our culture more polytheistic and animistic at the same time, right? So polytheistic because um, the work of Joe Henrik, the evolutionary anthropologist, he's he's shown that monotheism really rises, it gives it comes to being um, in line with the development of the early city states. You know, Judaism, one of the old, oldest monotheisms, gives you know basically works in parallel with the rise of the city state. If AI is very fragmenta- fragmenting, uh, fragmenting, and our our civilization sort of splits up, you know, that's going to lead to a kind of blossoming of different kinds of gods. And then there's the animism part. I mean, the animism part is just kind of obvious, right? You know, we're going to have toasters that talk to us. <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know, there's one one narrative that says, you know, Christianity kind of, um, you know, led the disenchantment of, of the world. That You know, it pushed our concept of God into something, this abstract higher being. Whereas in Japan, you know, the, the Shinto may see the forest as containing spirits and so forth. Well, in, in the West, the Christianity has rid the forest of the spirits and the forests are now just trees. Um, I think AI will in some sense sort of lead to a re-enchantment. And in, in part, it will be a kind of delusion because um, while we may build systems that are sort of genuinely intelligent, genuinely cog- uh, have genuine cognition. We'll also have a lot of systems that um, sort of fool people that seem like they're intelligent, that um, are a simulacra of intelligence. And we're, we're already seeing that in the context of human relationships where, where people um, are spending, uh, there's a website, Character AI, character.ai, where you can have just sort of conversations with the AI Elon Musk and stuff like that. They're, they're averaging over two hours of, of uh, uh on, on site time. So people visit that site and they have two hour conversations. There's people who are following, falling in love with their chatbots um, and substituting for like real human relationships. And that, that I think is concerning. John, I mean, um, a few years ago, well, several years ago, maybe it's five, five years ago, uh, our friend James Poulos, you know, started to make comments about categorizing the bots or that, you know, basically the, 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 your our oracular theological, friend James oracular friend James <laughs> yeah, your theological background was the most important thing to understanding technology, and it was sort of like, oh, you know, you know James being a mystical rock star again, and now he's just been proven <laughs> objectively the case, objectively right. I mean, I think it's, I think it's, I think my view on AI is, is deeply shaped by my faith more than any other kind of technology, because the first question you you ask is, can it have a soul, and or can it be like us? Right. And a materialist has no good reason to say it can't be like us. And I disagree. I'm a Christian. I think I believe in the Imago Dei. I believe that um, the soul, the soul of humans is something that's distinctive from uh, uh, not just not just things we, we make, but also the rest of the created order even. Um, and so I'm not really I also believe that uh, as sort of as Sam alluded to, you know, that we will be that our mistake is that we project ourselves like narcissists everywhere we look. We project our, we anthropomorphize things, we project our consciousness, we project meaning into things. Um, yeah, if people and, treat their dogs like their children, why wouldn't they treat AI like a human? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and and also as something that we are making, we can make it more more susceptible, more more more, uh, more easily projected onto. And we've already started to do that with things like these, these chatbot systems. Um, Another level, though, you know, I think that the much of the despair or danger or fright that people have of AI is that they that f- since the Enlightenment, we've believed that humans were on the top of this sort of intelligence totem pole, right? And now we have something that might might displace us. But as a Christian, especially someone rooted in, in the kind of um, uh, more magisterial tradition, I've never felt that way. And I don't think Christ- I don't think the Christian religion teaches that, right? Not only is there God above us, but there's also a whole uh, panoply of principalities and powers and angels and demons and other intelligences that are that christian theology teaches are more intelligent than us um you know my friend mike's so human, human virtue human value not coming exclusively through intelligence, intelligence that's right and rationality that's right. right um mike sacostas wrote a, a piece uh the analog city in the digital city several years ago in the new atlantis where he he questions whether we'll you know we'll have a kind of recovery of the medieval 
view of mine. You know, med medieval people are always walking around and they're always being harassed by annoying spirits and sprites and leprechauns. And uh, <laughs> I sort of think that's actually a pretty good model for the, who, the who toaster that won't shut up in the morning is going to be right. the local yeah, leprechaun. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you'll have to you know cast a warding spell <laughs> or something. Yeah, like the beast. Learn the magic words that'll make the toaster exactly. Shut yeah, up. yeah. How how is learning the magic words that'll shut the toaster up any different from like saying a prayer to ward off a, an well, annoying demon? You know? This is a point. Um, Yasha Bach, the computer computer scientist, makes is that he, he he's also sort of a materialist like me but you know he he he's he's open to using the language of spirit and spirituality mm -hmm. you know in the context of understanding that these are emergent properties of complex systems um but he argues that we should be striving to actually build systems that are uh, in some ways sentient or conscious because otherwise we're, we'll just be building golems um and you know that may be an even more terrifying future right yeah, although certain, I, think that's, certain, I think that's a future where we're we're going to end up, and this is this is I think the last point. I'll be a little bit cryptic about this, but um, you know uh, the the Christian theologian Joseph Pieper points out that any any uh, philosophy of the future future is implicitly a theology of the future because it, if theology deals with the interpretation of sacred texts, then any philosophy of history takes a stand on whether one or several sacred text is right about what the future holds, right? And Christianity has uh, prophecy about the future. And I think, uh, you know, any person of faith reading those texts sees particular technologies as uh, as caught up into the Christians have understood as sort of the system of antichrist. Mm -hmm. And you can also view that as a, as a metaphor for a certain deeply inhuman way of, of inhabiting the world. And um, I see in AI both tremendous potential, but also in some of its potentials for for centralization and totalitarian use. I see basically like the system of Antichrist. Yeah, AI, so Levi I think AI Leviathan. Shapes. AI Leviathan. That's mm -hmm. right. Gives me the creeps. So so far, we've been primarily talking about the concerns that each of you have about AI, but relative to most of the public discourse, especially in the paper belt of, you know, mm -hmm. the East Coast and uh, politics and uh, and government and academia, you guys are technological optimists, relatively mm -hmm. speaking. Um, and so I'd like to go through a couple of the common concerns that exist about AI and uh, and hear you guys tell me that it's not really that big a deal. I mean, American Moment is is probably pretty unique amongst self-identified right-wing organizations in Washington. We say priority number eight, technological progress is crucial to national prosperity. Our technological advancement is crucial to national prosperity. We've always believed that. And so I'm generally a letter rip guy, but there are real concerns to be uh, negotiated here. One of the easy ones that people always bring up is uh, the jobs. Aren't all the jobs going to be taken away by the, the, the robots with the brains? John, what say you? Yeah. So, and by the way, I should we should give a shout out here to uh, the Foundation for American Innovation, uh, where uh, Sam is a senior economist. I'm a senior fellow. They're the, if I can say this, the preeminent right of center think tank trying to uh, uh, help uh, integrate technology and our society for a more perf perfect union, um, and delivering that kind of technological advancement that, that can underlie American prosperity. Um, so, I think the jobs the jobs issue is overblown. For uh, you know, it's a good reason and a bad reason. The good reason is that most jobs are more complicated than, and if you break them down to the task level, require more human judgment and charisma, et cetera, uh, than uh, the AI will be capable of for a while. On the other end, the jobs that could be automated by this technology, in many cases, have already been basically automated, right? Like everything that Jet Chat GPT could, or a GPT-like system could do in a Starbucks barista job is already done by a much dumber AI. Like you didn't like, we've been able to automate a lot of jobs with much dumber AIs and automation systems than like a GPT-4. Um, so there will be significant changes and, and some very specific jobs like copywriting is not a good business to be in right now. Being a being a coder, but like a very bad coder is a bad business to be in right now. Uh, but I don't think it's something that's gonna drive mass unemployment, uh, at least without significant changes in what AIs can do in the world of atoms. Yeah, I mean, learn to drywall is all I would say. <laughs> um, it is interesting. There is a lump of labor fallacy, what, what economists would say, uh, that uh, you know technology has never led to persistent uh, permanent unemployment. Um, the trend throughout human history, including you know the transition from agriculture to, the, to industrialization, has been new jobs arise, new demand. Uh, there's new demand for new, new goods. Our, our wants are, are infinite. 
Um, and that will remain the case. And any in a world where we do uh, see real, genuine technological unemployment, will be a, a world of fully automated electric tree communism. So it's like it's, it's like a world. It's a world where ca- capitalism sort of breaks down, and you work, you know, one hour a year, and you make your enough money to you know live live like a king. So um, I'm not particularly concerned about that. And in fact, I think um, the the ironically the way the jobs that AI is th- are threatening uh, is not the you know the Andrew Yang truck driver. It's um, sort of the knowledge classes. Uh, it, it is. It's sort of you know. It's it is polarized. It's people working at call centers and lower level copywriters and stuff like that. But it's also lawyers and doctors and accountants and tax examiners and bureaucrats. You know, I think bu- bureaucracy is in for a really rapid evolution because anytime we've had these kind of uh, these trends, it's led to pretty dramatic changes in civil service. Um, and when you think about it, a bureaucrat is just a, like a fleshy API. So um, it makes sense that uh, we could in- inject a little bit of automation through um, systems like ChatGPT because what makes them different is they're not just automated automating on a, on a, on rails. They they have that little bit of context judgment and and deeper understanding that uh, is really all the human there is doing to to, to check boxes. Yeah, yeah, so no, no, if so, I can add, add to this, nothing is going to set the paper belt on fire more than this <laughs> technology, right? Like from a purely like you know, like who wins, like who to whom or who wins standpoint, the right should be very, uh, should be cheering this technology on, right? This, we're in DC, there are, there are literally tens if not hundreds of thousands of people in this metro area whose sole job is to fill out government paperwork of yeah. different kinds, right? Whether it's uh, in a government position or uh, in, uh, uh, you know, contracting, con- you know, grant giving, uh, reports, environmental reports, like all of these things can be very; these are some of the easiest things to automate potentially. Yeah. Uh, so and are a source of huge sort of regulatory capture, right? That's right. Um, you mentioned like NEPA making it impossible to build anything. Uh, you know, there's like a handful, like two or three major environmental law firms that do all the biggest environmental impact statements, which take you know years and years to do. Uh, there are already companies working on uh, using large language models to basically automate the process of environmental uh, reviews and, and ultimately permitting and things like that. So it will it's going to dissipate the rents really quickly. <laughs> and that's precisely why um, there's going to be so much, uh, you know, the, the Butlerian Jihad is just sort of getting started, right? Because the people whose um, not just income, but status is going to be affected are also some of the most politically powerful and have the most voice because they're people who work in media, they're people who work, um, it, you know, in these knowledge sector jobs. Um, and we, we saw when, you know, Obama tried to, you know, repeal the 529 savings account, you know, <laughs> all the people that came out of the woodwork to stop that. It's a very powerful class. Um, and, uh, and, and you know, it took us like over a decade to realize the China shock was as bad as it was because the people who's, who lost their jobs didn't really, you know, quote unquote matter. Um, this is going to be very different. And I think it's also one of the reasons I'm a little bit like accelerationist on the dimension of like, let's let's push these existing models out as fast as possible while still reserving some concern, some, I think, legitimate concern for what's coming down the pike is because that these two things shouldn't be conflated. Because one of the things I worry about now uh, is that the whole AI safety discourse is going to get captured by incumbent interests and spun towards protecting um, their own, you know, their own pocketbook rather than uh, the things that we're talking about, which don't quite yet exist, but uh, will exist really quickly. Yeah. If I can jump in on this. You like in the last 40 years, um, so we often talk about small, medium, and then large businesses, right? But the reality of the matter is there's no, almost no such thing as a medium-sized business anymore. And partially it, this has to do with the story of p- large uh, private equity. But I think a big part of it is regulation, right? It, there are different regulatory thresholds for when you have to meet a bunch of regulatory requirements. And they basically create massive disincentives to growing businesses over a certain size, right? Um, and that means it's small yeah, you, ba- you basically have your sub Dunbar number of businesses and everything else. Exactly. Like, and it's, it's that's all right. giant companies after that. Exactly. And so um, one of the things that this technology potentially means is that small business owners can grow their businesses and meet at least some of those regulatory requirements using automation. Um, you know, there's a worst case scenario, as Sam is pointing to, where if we allow enough regulation, particularly by incumbent actors of these of the, this technology, it's not going to damage the open eyes and the Facebooks and the Googles. They're still going to transition to technology. They're still going to ram a certain ideology down everyone's throats. They're still going to they're going to uh, uh, you know do whatever they can to improve efficiencies at large. Like imagine you had a regulatory reporting requirement for AI systems at the firm level, right? It's not going to stop Target or Anheuser Busch 
or JP Morgan Chase from using these systems, but it will stop, you know, somebody's local like contracting business or roofing company that could be growing their company and using this technology to replace HR Karen. So um, I think it's really important that Republicans get smart about and conservatives get smart about the class structures and class warfare embedded in how this technology is taken up. Um, and I was kind of disheartened by, among other things, you know, Senator Hawley's letter to Facebook chastising them for open sourcing their model when they were the only large company to open source the model. They were the, for what was his argument? That it was dangerous. Uh, and he basically tied it into some of the other Facebook meta, you know, conservative complaints over the last few years. Um, and yet meta is behaving very differently on this issue. Right. They're the only large company that uh, isn't prepared to sort of lock the technology down and do what the regulators want. Um, and so, again, I, I think it's just a matter of this being a very new technology and Republicans and conservatives haven't really gotten to think very much about it yet. Well, well and just in general, the people on the left and the right are, are trying to make AI kind of backwards compatible with their existing political uh, That's right. gripes, right? And yeah. so the people on the left are most worried. AI about, is also about Section 230. Yeah, yeah exactly. Totally. There's yeah, something, yeah, yeah. something to, like, yeah. as we're taping this, like, two or three hours ago uh, from Holly and Blumenthal on uh, on AI and 230. Um, or, you know, on, on the left, it's more about, like, disinformation and deep fakes. What, what will this mean for the election? What about civil rights? And is the AI anti-racist enough, right? And so <laughs> yep. these, these are rear view mirror perspectives um, even if they're right re whether they're right or wrong they're just like in some ways implicitly denialist because yeah. they're trying to make this some this thing that is actually quite different it, this this time is different in some ways um, and that has to be factored in so what are some of the worst proposals on the table for how AI is going to be regulated <laughs> and why do you guys hate them so much we'll start with John oh man how much time do you have um I think my favorite might be an IAEA for AI, which would involve... So right the now, IAEA is the International Atomic, Atomic Energy, Energy Association, right? Yeah. Um, one of the most feckless organizations in the international system completely failed to stop nuclear proliferation. Um, you know, the United, States, the United States is a key leader in AI right now. Uh, China is lagging behind. The EU is way behind. And the idea of basically, you know, subjecting American AI companies to not just national, but international regulation of algorithms and making sure the algorithms are are uh, anti-racist enough, as you said, is just comical. And the people proposing it also seem to know nothing about how about the history of international associations mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. uh, that's up there. And FDA for AI is another one that's, that's up there. Of like, yeah, Chamath that said that you should do that, right? Yeah, yeah. Let, let, yeah let's, let's just allow no AI development until... Uh, the you know the bureaucrats in Washington get to get to run whatever the AI equivalent of a clinical study is, um, <laughs> yeah. So those are pretty bad. So yeah, yeah I mean I, t I definitely agree with the AI 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 EAs AIs EAs IAEAs like uh, all these things are starting to get blended together. I mean, I just the idea that like you know North Korea could have a turn on the you know leading the AI council would yeah. doesn't really make sense to me. Um, <laughs> Um, and and in general, like we even at the history of the, of the uh, Atomic Energy Asso Association, you know, it really grew out of of you know U.S. diplomatic and State Department um, sort of leadership because we yeah. did the Manhattan Project, and then we were like, we need to make sure that uh, this technology doesn't proliferate. And so, even if something like that comes about, really, it's going to be. Uh, a patina on uh, American hegemony. Like America is going to be the leader here. We have to ensure that America is the leader here. And maybe we're working with the UK or other other uh, people we're, we have close partnerships with, um, but we need to get there first and promulgate the standards worldwide rather than putting putting up for a vote from the General Assembly. That's right. Just, uh, so on that note, two other additional, um, you know, amongst, there are, there are a number of people who are more concerned about existential risk than about the Chinese Communist Party. So, you know, Sam Altman the other day uh, proposed that we cooperate with China on you know, international AI standards, which at least would, would some extent involves sort of open kimono on what what we're building. That seems like a bad idea. Even worse, in, in the effective altruist community, amongst the people who are most concerned about X risk, there was a proposal several years ago to for you know smart up and coming engineers to go into China to work for Chinese AI <laughs> companies to help them develop AI. So that you know the alignment problem would get sufficient attention within China's AI development. <laughs> Maybe you hear even among sort of 
uh, well-meaning sort of NGO types that uh, you know China is way ahead of us on uh, AI regulation because they, they yeah. they've put out restrictions on large language models and so on um, you know really really quickly uh, and that's partly because they they're developing their own language models that you know have to uh, practice G thought and uh, right. espouse, you know, the tenets of socialism yeah. and stuff, stuff like That's that. That's right. If, if China can chain a, a transformer that doesn't, that will not make Xi Jinping Winnie Pooh jokes under any circumstances, <laughs> they will solve the alignment problem. And, and, and our, and our uh, colleague Jeffrey Kane just testified actually on the on this topic. He um, has a uh, a book on the what he calls the perfect police state um, that China China's control of the Uyghur population is in part a. Uh, a pilot program for Chinese society as a whole and what they can do with surveillance. So that's quite frightening. And it's also something that they plan on, on exporting because I think, I do think AI is going to be like this one of the meta meta risks is going to be incredibly destabilizing uh, to a lot of legacy institutions in the same way the internet sort of destabilized, you know, the Arab spring and so forth. Um, and there's going to be a lot of sort of impact di dictatorships, including, you know, some, a few European countries that will probably want to import some of that technology so they can maintain their social order. So we, we want to make sure that not only does the U.S. lead um, in developing the frontier of the technology, but that we're also exporting tools that, you know, have the best of both worlds, that have all the capabilities of AI, but have the sort of civil liberties protections built in. How sticky do you think the advantage that either particular firms in the United States have right now or the United States has more broadly in AI competition is? A huge advantage. China is pouring a ton of money at, the, at this. I wouldn't. I wouldn't count them out of like catching up. Um, you know, in part because uh, you know Microsoft Research in Beijing <laughs> has probably yeah. some a lot of talent. Sequoia, China, and, uh, uh, yeah. Um, but fundamentally, right now, uh, there's two the two most important inputs other than energy into training large models are access to GPUs, advanced GPUs, and chips, and and the talent. And, and really, those are made where. Taiwan. Yeah. <laughs> so this is why Taiwan is uh, such a big deal and uh, and why developing our own ship capacity is also a big deal. But the talent thing is really the most scarce, the, mo the most scarce factor. Even even chips are is in some ways downstream from talent. You know, um, uh, TSMC depends on um, a, a, an incredible education system where you're like, you know, you're, you're 13 years old and you already know you're going to be a semiconductor engineer. <laughs> you know, it's uh, this going back to the point about tacit knowledge. Um, there's a huge talent uh, shortfall that we have in advanced chip manufacturing, but also in the, in the development of these AI models, like there's probably like 400, 500 people who, who, you know, if, if they all you know, died, died in a Hindenburg crash would probably grind AI uh, progress to a halt. Um, it's incredibly ta concentrated and China has difficulty attracting and maintain, retaining that talent, but they also have this this uh, crazy sort of signal to noise problem where, yes, they're producing a lot of research, but a lot of it is just garbage. Um, and yeah, it's like infinitesimal, like edge um, innovation on like existing corpuses of research where the core innovations were American. Or, or people that, just, or just pu pumping up their citations and, yeah. and or, or yeah, outright yeah. copying. Yeah. Um, so I, I think America is well positioned to maintain a lead, but um, we can secure that position more, more uh, confidently if we properly enforce the export controls on, chi on semiconductors to China, right? So the Biden administration, uh, I guess in last October, issued uh, pretty comprehensive export controls on advanced AI logic chips to China and, and along with uh, lithography equipment and other things that go into the manufacturing of AI chips. Um, they're partnered with the Netherlands and Japan and several other countries on it. Uh, the big issue is the way we do these export controls is kind of insane like you have to be a company on the entity list so guess what china just creates another company <laughs> that's not on the list um and uh you know we're, we're, china's even allowed to you know purchase aws like cloud services to, to train their models um so there's a whole it's very leaky let's just say this uh, so one of the things i've been exploring is what we could do to um u.s based companies that you know do a lot of the design of these chips to require that they have building capabilities to be able to monitor and disable the chips if it's discovered that they're used in in chinese facilities that's like, you, that, that's something that's scalable right are you worried that putting that level of control inside the chips would set ourselves up for totalitarian government it depends on what they're being what they're capable of you said um, a naughty word now your house doesn't work anymore 
<laughs> I mean, there's literally right a thing about there, this man. with, with, that with about. the the ring light. Yeah. yeah, what what I'm what I'm most interested in is is a kill switch. To be frank, um, in, you know, maybe this is an area where where John's a little more skeptical, but I do I I do think we're it, we're going to want to at some point um, have a pre pre-registered training runs where if you want to train your 10 trillion parameter model that's G, like GPT-8 or something like that, um, we want to know we want to know about it and we don't want to rely on a international organization to do that work. We're the premier exporter of, of chips and chip design. We're going to be able to do this automatically by just uh, having something on device. Yeah, I mean, I think that there are, I'm, I'm well, here, here's one thing I will say. Uh, the kind of chips that you can put in a server rack and do really, really large training models are not the kind that consumers, even advanced consumers, are purchasing. Sure. Right. So I'm with, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Poulos. Uh, I do believe in a Second Amendment for com com compute. I think it's important that Americans have the have the right, and ideally, hopefully, a constitutional right to do certain kinds of compute on their own hardware. Mm -hmm. I don't think. Uh, kill switches on server rack GPUs <laughs> is really a threat to that per se. Um, the, you know, I also, I think we, I think you, we will you, you would regulate with, private security companies, but not the ability to own a firearm. That's right. Yeah. That's a good way to, good yeah. way to put the, the, the difference or, you know, you can have, you can have handguns, but not bazookas. Yeah. Um, unless you're in Texas, then you can have bazookas. <laughs> uh, the other thing is, um, I do think we can, you know, with, with with a little bit of, of prudence and intelligence, we can we can arrive at a safety a model of, of AI de-risking that involves a fair amount of cooperation and standard setting uh, amongst the companies that are in a position to train large models. Right, we don't necessarily have to have a strict regulatory framework or one in which the government is like deciding who gets to train models hmm. and whatnot. Um, you know, these are, again these are the questions we need to be thinking about and dealing with now. Um, and I, I agree on the question of China. I do agree with Sam that w the U.S. has some enormous advantages here. And the way things are shaping up with the EU is basically shooting itself in the foot with AI. And they think you know, basically what happened with Web 2.0 and the Internet was uh, it became a very big deal. And then the, e the EU regulated it sort of after the fact, imposed massive penalties on American companies. And they just kind of like... They just kind of grinned and bared it, grinned and bared it, and they now think they're going to do that with AI, and I think they're just totally wrong. Mm -hmm. So they're taking themselves out of the running on AI, and it really does look like the world of advanced AI development is going to basically be the U.S., the U.K., Japan, and China. Yeah, I basically agree with that, and, and there's a, there's also an irony with the way Europe is going. And by the way, Europe is going to have a huge uh, influence on U.S. policymaking um, because. You know, they have a special envoy in San Francisco. They're they're actually currently lobbying Sacramento to try to pass a law in California that, that's mirrored on the EU, EU AI Act. Um, right, because between the EU and all the aggregate of consumer power it has there, and then California specifically yeah. in the United States, you end up putting a ton of regulatory weight on the entire yeah. world between exactly. those two locuses yeah, of power. Absolutely. And this is this is one reason why I really think it's important to draw a line between um, the the core sort of island of AI safety risks, like real concerns with future models and current, currently existing models. So there is an irony where like guys like Gary Marcus, who testified alongside Sam Altman, doesn't think we're going to build a artificial general intelligence anytime soon, but wants the FDA for for AI because he, he's- Because he wants it anyway. <laughs> well, he's concerned about deep fakes and so on. And there's yeah. this like deep irony that, um, you know, the way the market has responded to spam has been, spam and bots has been through private initiative and industry standards. You know, if you've ever done like the recapture process to prove you're not a robot to get onto a website, like that's something that Google and others have helped develop and refine and improve. And when there's an exploit that can get around it, they build a better version. And th that process will continue. The irony is because of GDPR, the privacy law in, in Europe, which is terrible. Re recap kind of productive. <laughs> well, recaptcha, uh, you know, works in part by looking at your cookies, right? Your your web browser cookies, which you know, under GPR, you're allowed to, to turn off your cookies, right? <laughs> and guess what? Bots can also turn, decline to share their cookies. Um, so there may be a world where, like, we do get inundated with deep fakes. The United States develops lots of countermeasures, and Europe has their hands tied behind the back because the countermeasure involves some, like, uh, you know, I, iota of privacy violation. Yeah. yeah. I, I just, to add on to that, I mean, I, I absolutely think Americans need to to understand and develop the idea of technological sovereignty, right? And I think we already don't appreciate how much bureaucrats in Brussels and Sacramento 
uh, are shaping uh, the technologies that everyday Americans get to use. And I think it's it's mm-hmm. unconstitutional and we shouldn't stand for it. And they're choosing to balkanize the Internet, right? Like, I understand why China did it. China's an author- authoritarian country. They want to have a firewall. Uh, why Europe, which, you know, the you know, the, the epicenter of Western civilization is is choosing to essentially build walls around their own internet? Because this is what will happen. You know, the more and more of content is going to be done through generative AI. Um, under the EU AI Act, they will have extraterritorial scope to fine American companies if the outputs of their AI models wind up in Europe. That's and, and, and the, 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 first of all, what that means is all these AI companies are going to have not available in your country uh, on the pages when Europeans try to go visit them. Um, but, you know, longer run, it means that Europe is going to be lacking the AI tools that are required to sort of keep pace with with AI threats because this is sort of an adversarial race. We need AI to fight AI. And they're, they're, they, they're going to be fighting with one hand behind their back. Y'all briefly name dropped this, and I think it's a particularly evocative example of what this technology is going to cause in terms of new social uh, concerns, uh, deepfakes. What, what do we do about it? I mean, there's something I think particularly offensive to people about being lied to about human to machine interaction. They, they want to be able, I think people feel like they have a right to be able to recognize what it what is real when it comes to something being presented to them as a person, their words, their actions, or even their presence, you know, there's a trillion different issues that you could spin off from this ranging from the generation of child pornography to should the American Express chatbot have to announce that it's a robot and not an actual customer service person. John, how do you think about this broad issue of the imitation of humans? Uh, And then I want to hear what Sam says. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, I do think as a principle, it's it's you know we, we it's not good to lie to humans about being human. Um, if only well, we really are new territory here. Like for instance, you know I think what you'll find is that people who think that the chatbot they're working with is not human, some of them will respond by treating it as if it's human. Sometimes if they believe it's not human, they'll they'll basically treat it abusively, <laughs> which is not you know maybe not great either. I don't know how I feel about all that. Um, I mean, I think the, the obvious points that come from from you are again are, are kind of twofold. One, potential for fraud, like absolutely. Now we already have a huge amount of potential, potential for fraud. This is just sort of taking it a little bit to the next level. Um, and then two, maybe more importantly, again, what does this do to us as a civilization where we can imitate whatever we want to imitate uh, for ourselves, for an audience of ourselves, or for an audience of others? Right. I'm least concerned about deep fakes. Here's why. Um, there's a really good article in the New Atlantis last month called Shallow Fakes that kind of gets into this as well. Turns out that you can fool, if you're telling a group of internet users what they want to hear, you can fool 80 or 90% of them with a picture, a real picture, and a caption that could be completely made up, right? You can fool someone <laughs> about something that President Obama didn't say, or that C.S. Lewis didn't say, or Oscar Wilde, whatever, just by putting up uh, an image next to a quote, right? Um, you don't, the, the confirmation bias is so strong that it's really easy to fool people just with this sort of thing. You don't need deepfakes to do it. I think what deepfakes are most effective for politically, we're already seeing this, and we're gonna see this more in the 2024 election is influencing the vibes, for lack of a better word, um, influencing the way that, that someone is sort of presented. I think it's interesting. I'm aware of three uses of deepfakes so far in the 2024 election. One was the RNC releasing an ad that showed um, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris sort of celebrating on election day 2024. Uh, not particularly abusive of just you know showing a picture of them uh, in the context of this ad. And it's sort of dark, menacing, like you don't want this to happen. Uh, one was some Ron DeSantis supporter um, create, creating an ad about Trump, Trump's closeness with Anthony Fauci that included faked images of Trump and Fauci hugging. And one, maybe the most effective I've seen so far, was a spoof that some Trump supporter made of uh, Ron DeSantis in a clip from The Office where Michael Scott wears a woman's suit. But with uh, uh, Ron DeSantis's face and voice so perfectly superimposed on this, just unbelievably lethal political vibe making. Um, so I do think it's hugely significant, but I think it's not the, the people who are applying the model of misinformation and deep fakes are stuck in the age of print media. And I think we're, we're the the impacts it has will be internet era impacts. Yeah, I mean one of the 
you know, people um, the, doing the most sort of sky is falling around deep fakes has been Gary Marcus again. And um, ironically, like Gar Gary the other day, uh, a few weeks ago now, actually, um, was, uh, you know, uh, took it as evidence that deep fakes are going to be a big issue because there was this meme that went around that uh, the Pentagon had been struck or bombed or something like that and the stock market crashed because of it, like temporarily crashed. It turned out to be utter BS. The stock market went down and back up because of some consumer report in Europe. It had nothing to do with the picture. The picture itself looked like something you could have made with Photoshop five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Gary Marcus, the guy worried about deep fiction disinformation, got fooled, <laughs> by, Absolutely. Got, got misinformed. Um, How many layers deep? Did yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it was, you know, it's confirmation yeah. bias, right? And so I do, but that 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 is not to dismiss that, um, you know, in the very near future, there will be things that, uh, systems that will be able to generate um, videos of us having a conversation that are as photo real, real as the video being recorded right now, that have the annotation and inflection of our voices down to a T. That uh, you know, constituent callers uh, calls will be coming into into congressional offices, and it will have the Midwestern accent, so you know they're a real constituent. But actually, they're not actually. There's just a uh, chatbot that's ge auto generating text that will be able to read and reply to you. Uh, you know, reply to the person on the other uh, on the other side. It's going to be incredibly. Um, uh, uh, it's going to be a miasma. It's going to really uh, break a lot of our sort of epistemic consensus on things. But in some ways, that is how the world used to look, you know, a, a century or two ago. Like the the media environment of the 1800s was full of fake news, people being quoted all the time. That never the politicians never said that. Uh, you know, information took weeks to travel to you know to get you know get across the Atlantic, everything like that. In some ways, I think that's the world we're, we're returning to. And what that will mean is in, there will be people who are sort of ensconced in mythology and delusion, and there will be people who sort of re-cement their, their um, knowledge and things that are, are provable, that whether that's through, you know, maybe it becomes the killer use case for blockchain and other, other uh, encryption technologies that we were able to verify where the provenance of things are, are come from, or it may return us to a more sort of a truly analog medium, right? So I was at a, a wedding recently and the wedding, a beautiful wedding, the bride and grooms were in the middle of the church and the pews sort of wrapped around in a circle. Like that setup for a church is in, in part represents a sort of a way of cementing social consensus, right? Like you have everyone surrounding you from every angle. We're all bearing witness to this event. And that is a more reliable sort of a, a source of ground truth than, you know, a chain that co goes back to the social security office or something like that, right? Like in some ways, like Facebook, if you've been on Facebook since 2007 or 2008, like I have, you know, it has all my high school friends who could all tell you that I'm a real person, <laughs> yeah. you know, that that sort of network effect that brings a sort of deeper social consensus uh, will become much more important. And but in the meantime, um, companies will be under very intense competitive pressure to be able to filter uh, for content and identity because no one wants to go on uh, on LinkedIn for recruitment if half the accounts are fake. Right. And so there's a huge market incentive to solve this problem. Regulation could potentially make it worse, like I mentioned in the case of, of uh, GDPR and recapture. But bigger picture, it, the world is going to look very, very different. And um, there's some truth to people who are worried about this, but it's not the disinformation committees uh, that are going to solve the problem. It's going to be technology. On the left to center, the primary concern is misinformation, disinformation. I would say that one of the primary concerns on the right of center is obscenity. Uh, what do we do about that, John? Yeah, I think uh, we were talking, talking about this a little bit before. Um, you know, there's been this debate on the right about sort of common good, uh, common constitutionals or common good theories of law. And it has no, but we haven't really had to force the issue yet because you can arrive at, um, we don't arrive at many of the kind of, you know, consensus, right, right of center consensus ideas with other approaches. And I do think we're going to arrive at a series of legal questions that require us to take a stand on like what the good is. So right now, my understanding, I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding is our, our, um, our framework for um, for obs obscenity of the materials um, and particular on possession of them relies at least in part on the uh, the harms that are done uh, to uh, those who make the make those at least in cases of things like revenge pornography or child pornography um, and we now are in a situation where uh, you could you, you know even today you could you could make and possess child pornography produced by artificial intelligence 
including from built from data sets that verifiably do not contain child pornography already. So it's not like there's no like derivative effect of child pornography. Um, there are some libertarians who believe that the only harm of things like child pornography is that children were harmed to making them and that there's no nothing wrong with uh, consenting adults uh, owning and, and making use of this material. I think it's absolutely abhorrent. Yeah, those and people again, should be put in jail. Yeah, um, again, this is this is this is a side effect of this idea that what we put in the world of bits, or one should say, the world of our minds, of our spirits, is ir irrelevant to the body politic. And so, I think with the rise of AI, that's obviously the most extreme example, but there will be many other examples where we need to decide what is good for us as a society, what is good for us as humans, and be, build legal structures that enable us to give that the force of law. Gentlemen. Where can people keep up with everything that you're writing, saying, and thinking about this most important issue? Uh, the FAI.org, Foundation for American Innovation, and my personal substack is secondbest.ca. Yep, and you can find me also at the FAI.org and on Twitter.com. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much for coming on the show today. And thank you for not being giggling retards like most everyone else in <laughs> DC and not, not knowing how to actually uh, keep up in pace with technological innovation and public policy. And, th and thank you thank for you. being a great host, you know, trained by uh, a large language model at CPI. So <laughs> it's, it's our GPT. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs>Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. I certainly enjoyed taping it with them. I feel like it could have gone for three more hours. We should have had Pulos here as well. Maybe we'll do that still. Um, let us know if you want more content on this technology issue. We're certainly thinking about what our involvement on this issue is going to be in the coming years. Be sure to rate and review this podcast. Five stars only, please. Uh, subscribe on YouTube. I think we're getting close to 2,500 subscribers, over 150,000 views. Uh, be sure to uh, download the podcast every week on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Be sure to rate and review it. Uh, if you write something interesting in review we'll be sure to read it out on the show share it with your friends we post a ton of clips on youtube we post the show on rumble uh it's everywhere at ammoment.org thank you guys as always for listening and we will see you next week moment of truth is an american moment studios production filmed at the conservative partnership center our podcast is produced and edited by jake mercier and jared cummings our intro music is a minor struggle by ryan serenich don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more.